Um, Our reading today is from Acts 8, 9 through 25. Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, They sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers that that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I I lay my hands, may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry, because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness, and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, So this morning we're continuing in our series called Almost Christian. And uh, the idea for this series, really the heart for this series, comes out of a uh, large national study that was done some years ago on spirituality in America. And uh, what this uh, study uh, discovered is that the actual lived religion, that is the practical religion for many people uh, in America, even um, including uh, self-identifying Christians, uh, was not necessarily a faith that was Uh, anchored in the the tenets of historical Christianity, but rather a Christian-ish, almost Christian sort of faith that the researchers labeled MTD, right? We've heard this a few times during the series, or moralistic therapeutic deism. And and for uh, just a quick summary here, moralistic is be good, that a God exists who wants people to be morally good and kind And at the core of living a happy life is to be a good and moral person. So be good and then feel good, that this God wants us to feel good. Uh, The central goal of life is to be healthy, is to be happy, and to feel good about yourself. And then finally, deism, which means that there is a God who exists, but this God isn't necessarily involved in your daily life other than when you've got a big problem. And then call on God and he'll be right there for you. But otherwise, he isn't really around, so go ahead and live your life. Have fun. Enjoy. Now, we, we've been saying that this isn't necessarily 100% wrong, um, but we've been looking at how this view of Christianity is actually unhelpful because ultimately it's an, uh, it's an incomplete version of what Jesus actually taught, which means that it will hold us back uh, from the vibrant life-giving faith that Jesus actually talked about. And so today, what we're going to do, as we have over these past weeks, is we're going to look at another very commonly held view uh, of God. So this past Friday, uh, we went to, uh, to Target, Target in Stanford. And uh, when, after you get some stuff, there's, there's two options. There's the traditional old school wait in a line uh, and with, with a cashier. And then there's the automatic kiosk, right? The self-checkout. And the self-checkout can go horribly wrong sometimes. <laughs> Uh, but 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 we went for it today, and, and it, it, you know, or the, on this day we went, and it worked. And it tends to be actually, if it works well, pretty quick and efficient, and depending on your personality type, helpful because you don't have to talk to a human being. Um, so for some people, that's good. It's kind of a like, let's get this done, let's get this transaction done, insert payment, get what you came for, and really, uh, that's just a, a sign of the larger uh, dynamic that's happening in around our economy. 
that businesses, businesses build things around ease and efficiency for the customer. Uh, and that's how you really capture market share and how you appeal to very, very busy people. Uh, but in a way, a, a precursor to the automatic kiosk uh, was actually the, the vending machine. Now, I didn't know this, but I did some research on vending machines this week, something I never thought I would do in my life. Uh, but the first recorded example of a vending machine actually comes from uh, a Greek mathematician, Hero of Alexandria, who invented a device that dispersed holy water uh, for inside Egyptian temples. True story. True story. If you're, if you're into Trivial Pursuit, you're welcome. That's going to that's gonna help you. That's going to help you next time. Um, so other examples of vending machines uh, in the 1600s in taverns in England, there was a small brass machine that gave out tobacco. Uh, and then in the, uh, in the 1800s, 1822, there was a publisher and a bookshop owner who built a newspaper dispensing machine that allowed patrons to purchase banned works. Uh, and then the first fully automatic vending machine, which, uh, which dispensed stamps, came out in 1867. And so today, depending on where you are in the world, you can buy pretty much anything from a vending machine. I just have a few examples here. First one, maybe if you've been at an airport, maybe you've seen this before, Best Buy. Uh, so if you're at the airport and you're like, you know what? I think I do need to buy a laptop. Um, <laughs> then that's going to help you. That's going to help you. Or if you've been out and about, and uh, I think this one's in Japan, uh, you're on the go and you realize, I desperately need to make an omelet. Uh, <laughs> eggs, ready to go for you. Or if you're, this one's actually in New York City, why withdraw cash when you can withdraw a delicious cupcake? Um, or you're, you're at an event and you underdressed, pick up a tie. Uh, pick up a tie. Or maybe uh, you've had this feeling, and I know, I assume we've all been in this place before, where you're walking around and you feel your pockets and you realize, I don't have any gold bullion on me, and which no one, no one wants that, so get some gold. I don't know what, this is, in, this is real, this is in Dubai. I don't know in what context in life someone has to desperately get gold um, in that moment. And then finally, I love this one. Uh, if you've ever been in a place where you're so hungry that you wanted to fill a 7-Eleven big gulp with mashed potatoes, uh, <laughs> Well, there is good news for you today. Very good news. Now, here, here's the point. Here's the point. Um, here's the question. Is it possible that for many of us today, that uh, how we actually approach God, how we actually approach our relationship with God, more closely resembles our relationship with a vending machine than a relationship with the sovereign God of the universe we find in the Bible? Now, today's passage uh, actually has a lot to say about this kind of question. Now, it's one of the more bizarre passages in the book of Acts, uh, but there's actually something very relatable here about this view of God and this concept of God, something that is almost right, that's on the verge of being right, uh, that's sort of right, but it's actually less, far less than what God really uh, intends for us. And so what we're going to do today is we're just going to walk through this story a little bit and see what God I might want to show us here. And so uh, getting into the story, just a little bit of background here in, in Acts chapter 8. We're at a point here in early Christianity where followers of the way, where believers, where these early new Christians um, are being horribly persecuted, hunted down, put in jail, killed in some, in some cases. And so what they do is they scatter from the global headquarters of Christianity at the time, which is the city of Jerusalem. And they scatter from there, and they go all over the region except for the key leaders, that is like the, the more famous church leaders, the apostles who stay back, hunker down in Jerusalem. But most of the, the believers are scattered around to the region. One of them is a guy named Philip. And Philip goes to a place called Samaria. And there in Samaria, north of Jerusalem, a different region, he's speaking about Jesus, and there are miracles happening. And the power of God is breaking forth, healings, miracles, things that defy logic that defy people's expectations. Now, interesting to note that uh, Samaria, when it says that Philip went to Samaria, to the Jews in that time, uh, Samaritans were not, uh, were not your friend. Um, in, fact, it, in fact, there was a lot of rivalry between them. In, in some cases, barely human beings. There was a popular prayer in that time that said, Lord, do not remember the Samaritans in the resurrection. In other words, in eternity, 
let's just move on from the Samaritans. And the feeling was mutual. The feeling was mutual between both groups. But somehow, even in that context, um, incredible ministry is happening here. It says uh, in the text a bit, a bit earlier from what we read today uh, that there was much joy in that city. And so uh, you can imagine dinner, dinner conversations, like, did you hear about what's happening? This guy, Philip, and there's miracles, and there's, you know, the gospel was breaking forth in Samaria. And so that's the background, that's the context. And in the middle of that is where we pick up today, verse 9, where we meet a guy named Simon. It says this. Now, for some time, a man, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. He followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. Now, Simon is not necessarily a character that you, we might hear often about in church, not the most famous character by any means in the New Testament. Sometimes he's called a magician, uh, sometimes called a sorcerer. Some even believe that he had the same kind of background and training as the, the magi, the wise men of Christmas fame. Um, now, this profession wasn't uncommon in the ancient world. There were a lot of astrologers, magicians, fortune tellers. In fact, you can make a pretty good living doing that. Now, we don't know a lot about Simon, but we do know that he thought he was pretty amazing. Right? It says this, he boasted that he was someone great. And so, healthy self-esteem here. Uh, didn't need any uh, like self-help books on that, on that topic. And the thing is, other people agreed with him. Other people thought he was amazing too. It says all of the people, that is from every, uh, I said high and low, from every economic background, every uh, strata of society uh, paid attention to him and said, this man is rightly called the great power of God. And so that might mean that either he thought he was divine, uh, he, either he claimed he was divine, or at least, at very least, was a direct representative of the divine. And so who is Simon? He's a celebrity, right? People love him. Lots of followers on Instagram, uh, invited to every social event, popular, charismatic, right? He was somebody great. And so Simon is now listening to this guy, Philip, who's this Christian leader who comes into town who's speaking about Jesus. And Simon is listening closely. And so we keep going. Uh, but when they, that is the Samaritans, the, the crowds who are listening, believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. They were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. And so now lots of people are following, uh, starting to uh, pursue Jesus, and it says that Simon himself believed. Another translation says, even Simon believed. Even Simon believed. And so the story is going well. Simon is into Jesus. He's on board. He signed up for a Bible study, the marriage course. I don't know if he did that. Um, meanwhile, back in Jerusalem at the headquarters, Peter and John are there. Again, these are great Christian leaders, and they hear about what's happening over at the field office in uh, Samaria, and they hear about great conversions and great things that are happening, and so they want to see for themselves what's taking place there. And it comes to their understanding uh, that though, these, though the converts in Samaria had believed that there really weren't any outward signs of the Holy Spirit filling people. Now, as a church, we believe that every Christian, every follower of Jesus has the Holy Spirit within them at, at the moment of salvation. But, uh, but at times, the Holy Spirit is more like a pilot light, if you think about like a stove, like a pilot light than a, than a blazing furnace. And so these believers uh, had the pilot light, but these apostles come in and they say, we want to pray over you and kind of fan that flame that would become a full furnace. And so what it says is that they place their hands on the people and pray for these new believers to be filled anew with the Holy Spirit. And then things start to get complicated. It says this, that when Simon saw that the Spirit was given uh, at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. 
And so Simon is taking this in. Simon is watching this all happen. And he sees there must be some kind of connection between the physical act of laying on hands and the passing on of the Holy Spirit. There's some kind of special ability. And in this moment, something inside of Simon is triggered. He realizes, I can't do that. I don't know how to do that. Now, we've probably all been there before, some version of this, when you're, uh, you're stable, things are good at work, things are okay in your, kind of your, your uh, ecosystem of your life. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, it's comfortable, it's stable, and then all of a sudden, a new talented coworker shows up at work. Or there's a new kid on your team who's just a little bit better than you. Or there's somebody who enters your social circle who just seems to have it all together where all of a sudden, where you were feeling very comfortable, now you start to feel exposed. You start to feel insecure because your standing, your abilities, your image, it's not as great as it was a moment ago. You feel unsafe. And so that's what's happening here with Simon. Simon was like, I was doing pretty well, and now he has FOMO, right? The fear of missing out, right? Am am I old news? Am I washed up? Do I have a purpose? And this shakes him to his very uh, core because his whole career, his whole life is based on being great, right? On astounding people. And it's worked so well up until this moment, but now there's something better than him. And as the slogan goes, if you can't beat him, join him. And so in his attempt to join him, he does the thing he knows how to do and he takes some money, and he tries to exchange that money for the ability to lay hands on people and that they would receive the Holy Spirit. Because think of the market value. Think of the potential here, right? He had been working with AOL dial-up internet, and now he's about to have a high-speed connection, (laughs) right? He has struck gold. He sees how the system works, and he can have all of this for himself. And so why does Simon want the Holy Spirit? Why does Simon want the presence of God? Because it's a good business decision. And so everything has been going so well up into this moment. And then here's what happens next. Peter answers, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Now, I'm guessing that poor Simon wasn't expecting this level of, uh, of feedback here, but really what's, what's happening? What's the response here? Um, what went wrong? It's really that Simon's heart is being revealed. And so, yes, he believed in Jesus. He had been baptized even, but there's something of his old way of being, the old self in the language of the Bible that's still guiding his Um, his actions and his perspective. Peter says, your heart, Simon, is not right before God. Really an echo of the words of of Jesus, right? Who said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Because I know this in my own life, whatever is in my heart eventually uh, comes to the outside. Eventually it will be externalized to the people around me in my words and in my behaviors. And so it's not just that Simon is confused about the Holy Spirit. It's that there's a deeper issue. There's actually a heart issue here that's being exposed, that's being called out. Because even though Simon um, was a believer, something is just slightly off here. And that is that Simon sees God as a sort of a vending machine. Simon wasn't interested in being used as a servant for God's glory. Instead, he wants to use God as a servant for his own glory. For his agenda. The vending machine God is this subtle version of faith where instead of placing ourselves under the rule and the authority and the sovereignty and the leadership of Jesus, we want Jesus to serve us, right? Where, where, where our prayers, where our actions, where our desires is kind of like putting coins into the vending machine. Now, just think about our actual experience with vending machines. Um, now, a vending machine is, is uh, a lot of things. One, it's controllable by us. Uh, A vending machine is transactional. That is, uh, it's a tidy formula, money in, product out. And uh, a vending machine is impersonal. That is, I get what I want and then I move on, right? There's no connection. There's nothing that lasts from that. There's there's no relationship. Um, And then think about what happens when the vending machine doesn't work, right? 
Who here has shaken a vending machine before, <laughs> right? Kicked a vending machine, right? Because you feel cheated, you feel robbed, you feel disappointed. I need that bottle of Aquafina. I deserve it. Now, when it comes to life with God, there's a very in-your-face version of this. Maybe we call it the prosperity gospel. We picture TV evangelists, um, gold chairs, white suits, ministry jets, ministry horses. I don't, that's a, I don't think that's a real thing, ministry horses, but it could, it could be. Um, you know, send in your money today. Send in your money and you'll receive a blessing from God, right? We, we, that kind of thing. And culturally, we are, we are very skeptical of this kind of thing. But that's the big, brash, in-your-face version of this. But there's actually a much more subtle version that's more prevalent and more common in our thinking. And really, it's what MTD proposes, moralistic therapeutic deism, the T especially, therapeutic, that God's purpose, that God's reason for being is to make me happy and healthy and rich. Now, I'm not saying that the opposite is true, right? I'm not saying that God wants everybody to be miserable, sick, and poor. Amen. No, that's not what I'm saying. But it's simply that we do not control how God actually works. And it's certainly not controlled through some mechanism, something that we do, some lever we pull. Now, for me, as a pastor, as someone who talks to many people about uh, faith, uh, one of the common things I see as a struggle for so many people is disappointment with God. Um, and that is expecting God uh, to produce something very, very specific that we wanted. And so, Lord, give me that job. Lord, give me that promotion. Give me that health breakthrough. Uh, give me a romantic partner. Give me the outcome I want. And sometimes things go exactly as you want them to go. But often, it doesn't. And it's in those very moments that many Christians are crushed by their own expectations for how they thought their life was going to go. See, a vending machine view of God will set you up for huge disappointment, for, uh, for disillusionment, for pain, because that's not how God actually works. See, Simon is drawn to Jesus, drawn to this message of the good news, but uh, his view of God isn't as a, re a relational being but as a religious product to be consumed. He misses the point. I think a simple illustration for how this works, how this is working for Simon here and how it can work in our lives, is think about how a parent relates to a toddler. Let's say that you have a one-year-old on your lap, and you're sitting by the window, and you see a beautiful bird outside on a branch. And so you're eager to show this beautiful bird to this young child. And so what you do is uh, you excitedly point out the window and you say, look, look at that bird. But what does the child do? The child looks at your pointing hand, right? Maybe even tries to imitate you. The child might see the sign, might be excited because you're excited, uh, but never sees the bird because the purpose of the sign is missed. See, what's happening in our story with Simon here is that he sees the sign of what Philip is doing, what Peter's doing, what John is doing, and it's better than what he can do. He gets excited about that, right? He wants to imitate that, but he never sees what the sign was actually pointing to. He never sees Jesus for who Jesus really is. He misses Jesus. He misses the relationship. He misses the deeper level heart conversion. He misses repentance. He misses real new life. See, the point of Christianity is not just about acquiring blessings from God or breakthrough or having our prayers answered in the exact ways that we want, as good as those things are, right? And there's not a person in here today who doesn't want that to happen. I want that to happen. But the point isn't just to get the blessing. The point is that we actually get Jesus, right? We get relationship, forgiveness, uh, transformation, new purpose, and eternal hope. See, a vending machine God is formulaic, right? It's a God who is predictable, impersonal, but the God of the Bible shows us that the ultimate, shows us the ultimate personal action when he came to dwell um, in the person of Jesus Christ, not as a vending machine, not as some sort of cosmic genie, not to give us what we think we need, but what we actually, or what we actually need, right? Not just what we want, but what we actually truly need it. 
No, this is a savior who could defeat sin and bring us back into relational wholeness with God. Now, it's one thing to be interested in God. It's another to be interested in what God can give me, but it's a whole different thing to actually desire God's presence and to desire God at the center of my life. Simon's barrier, even though he's almost there, is that he still wants to be at the center of his own life. The point of Simon's faith is actually to to further his business career, his brand, his agenda. He wants a relationship with God without any apparent interest in developing a relationship with God. He views God as a commodity. And it's so easy. I'll I'll be the first to raise my hand today. It is so easy to have this kind of view of God, to have this kind of posture toward God. God, right? The kind of, the kind of uh, view that says, look, God, I, I'm trying my best. I'm doing all this stuff. I'm trying to be a good person, to be a faithful follower. And so the, the logical output of that, right? The, the logical outcome of that well, should be that my life goes very well. And so if that is the formula that we're living by, then it's no wonder that we are very surprised by suffering because uh, we wonder what went wrong, what went wrong with the formula. Now, here's what, here's what Peter ends up saying to him. Again, it's pretty intense. We're going to look at it for a second and see what he really means. Here's Peter's response to this, you know, this idea of paying for, for something. Um, he says, repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. So Simon believed that God's free gift could be bought and sold, right? That, he, that God could be controlled, that God could be manipulated. And so P- Peter, think of him like a spiritual doctor here, diagnoses Simon's spiritual condition as full of bitterness and captive to sin. Now, what does he mean? He means that Simon isn't responding to the gospel here. Simon is responding to his own greed here by offering to pay what was already paid for on his behalf. Now, it's important to say this as well. Thankfully, God doesn't reject us uh, based on having impure motives for following him. If that was the case, we'd all be in a lot of trouble. We have a lot of different motives. I have a lot of motives at times. But Peter here isn't rejecting poor Simon. He's not just writing him off. He's inviting him to partake in something. He's inviting him to do something. And it's a very, very old-fashioned word called repent. 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 Now, many times when we hear the word repent, uh, there's, there's a lot of baggage for us. There's confusion. Maybe people have hurt us with that word. Maybe churches have hurt us around that word. And so we associate repent with sh- being ashamed and guilt and uh, condemnation or just trying to be a better person. But the word that's used for repent here isn't just be a better person or behavior modification. Uh, it literally means a change of purpose and thinking, right? A change of purpose and thinking. And so Christianity is an invitation not to consume God, but rather to be consumed by God, to be fundamentally transformed from the inside out in our purpose, in our thinking, in our motivations. We need a new heart if this is uh, going to be possible. And Christianity teaches that the proper response to God's gift of salvation is more than just a what's in it for me mindset. But the only way that this heart change is going to be possible for us is to really discover uh, Jesus who laid down his preferences. Jesus who uh, laid down his self-interest, handed himself over to suffering and to death so that the power of sin could be broken once and for all. The, really, the goal of Christianity, right, as we grow in our faith, uh, is, is to not just see Jesus as useful, but actually Jesus as beautiful. God is so much better than a vending machine, right? Even one that sells cupcakes. And today we can actually know that kind of transformation in our lives. And so today I really believe there are three, there are three responses. Maybe there's three places where, where we are today as a, as a community. And, and, uh, and first of all, uh, for those of us who maybe, you, maybe you've gotten what you wanted, maybe there has been a breakthrough, maybe there's something that's gone very well for you, uh, to say thank you, to practice gratitude, that's, that's your next step, to say thanks. Because here's what happened. 
uh, here's what happens. Breakthrough that isn't turned back into praise becomes entitlement, right? And so if good, good things are happening to me, if I don't say, look, this was ultimately you, God is the author of this, then all I'm gonna do is, yeah, and I deserved it. And, there, and that's just, again, it's that automatic, it's that vending machine type relationship. So we give that back to praising God. A second, there's some of us today who there's a lot of, maybe it feels like we're in a fog today. There's things about our future uh, that we don't know, that, that don't make sense to us, that we don't know what the outcome is. And the invitation today, rather than uh, the assumption that God is a vending machine, is actually to, to let go and to trust in the sovereignty of God, as Dallas Willard once said, to abandon the outcome to God, right? Not that we don't care, but we know that actually God cares way more than we do and can sort through that better than we ever could, has an ultimate plan for our lives. And then finally, uh, for, any, for any one of us uh, where we've uh, kind of gotten off track in our understanding of God, and maybe God has been reduced to that kind of that vending machine type mechanism for us, where it's not so much about relationship, it's more about what can we get. Um, it's in the best possible definition of this word, you know, repent. It's to, to change our minds, to change our purpose, right? Lord, give me a new heart. Give me a new purpose. Give me new motivations. Lord, replace this in me, right? And that's what God's inviting us into, to a change of mind, to a change of heart, to a change of purpose, that we would see him for who tr truly is. Amen? Amen. Let's, let's stand together. Let me pray for us now. So, Lord, we ask that you, first of all, Lord, we, we're just so thankful for who you are for your uh, consistency in our lives, for who you are here at Trinity Church, Lord. And uh, Lord, I ask right now that you would help me, that you would help us uh, see any points of self-seeking in our lives where maybe we're trying to, to get your power uh, for, for the wrong reasons. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would give us a vision that's an, only a vision for you, not just for your gifts, not just for your blessings. And God, I pray that you would uh, change our hearts today, that you would renew our hearts, that you would search our hearts, that you would refine us, that you would strengthen us, Lord, that you would use us to be a great blessing to those around us. And Lord, we're, you're so gracious that we can come to you with any motivation. Lord, but I pray if there's any part of us that has a motivation that is, that is less than healthy today. Uh, Lord, first of all, you do not condemn us. You look at us with love, with grace. You welcome us, whatever our starting point is, wherever we are with you today. Lord, but I pray that uh, you would give us new purpose today. You would give us a new mind. Lord, you'd give us a hunger for your presence, a hunger for who you are, a hunger for relationship with you, Lord, that that would be the anchoring point of our lives, the anchor point for our church, the anchor point for our future together, it, rooted in you and your goodness and your abundance and your provision and your care. Lord, we are so thankful for who you are, for your character and your goodness. And we pray all of this uh, in Jesus' name. Amen.